Come on, let's give a hand for Jesus this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time together under the word of Jesus. We thank you that each and every single person that is in this place or watching or listening to this word today would have a divine encounter with you. I thank you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you speak through me, reveal what people need to hear, that they would hear the gospel of Jesus in a way that the Holy Spirit would allow it to be personal, allow it to be full of life, allow it to be redeeming and restoring, that nobody leaves this word the same way that they came in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to church today. You are in the right place. The house of God is the best place to be. It is, it is where Jesus does his best work in your life as you sit under the word. You know, the word is not about tradition, but transformation. And in, I love it because when we sit in and under the word, it does something to us. So often people would say, Pastor, you know, when you ministered that word, and you told me to do these things, my life changed, and I will often be sitting there going, I never said those things. But the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And the Holy Spirit, on the back of us unveiling Jesus, he crafts a word just for you. So always sit under the word, expecting to hear something designed for your life, for your situation, for the questions you have for the things you need answered, for the comforts or the healing that needs to happen. Never sit here and think, I'm just wasting my time. Or never sit under the word thinking, I'm just ticking a box. No, under the word you have access to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And he wants your life to be a testimony of his glory and his goodness. So we're gathering again today under the word of Jesus. And last week, I uh, started a series which might only be two sermons, but I spoke from the subject, possessing what God has promised you. Can you say this? We say, possessing what God has promised me. Let's do it again. Say, possessing what God has promised me. See, you have a land, a place, a life, that you are born to possess. There's a calling on your life. In fact, the church is not actually a place where you should attend. The church of Jesus Christ is a body you are a part of. And we believe our responsibility as a church is to help you discover what you are called to do for Jesus. Not just to sit in church, yes, but to be a part of the body. Even right now, in this place, there are so many people serving, singing, hosting, uh, cleaning, even doing security, helping with kids, helping with youth, but they're not helping us just to have an event. No, they are being used by God, the hands and the feet of Jesus. And, and we, always, uh, we always believe that God has not just called you to attend church, but to be a part of the church. I often would say to our, our, our members at, at Redemption Church, we don't believe in members, we believe in partners. You know, no one, no one gets into a marriage and says, I'm a member of this marriage. No, you say, come on now, we're in this together. And there are things God has called only you to do. I, I can't show up at your friend's house, knock on the door, and they open and they say, hi, my name's Pastor Josh. I'd like to invite you to my church this Sunday. How many of you know that's possibly not gonna be the way they would come? You know what I'm trying to say? Now, I'm happy to do that, but God has placed people in your life. God has placed people in your apartment block, your street, your workplace, and you are the plan for them to find healing, wholeness, and redemption, amen? And the great thing is, if you would do what I can't do, which is get them to the house of God, right? Then I might do, or someone else who's ministering the word, do what maybe you couldn't do, which is unpack Jesus in a way that it speaks to their spirit. And together we partner for the kingdom of God. It's a partnership, and you are called, and you possessing land, you, and I don't just mean natural land, I mean you possessing what God has called you to possess is essential in people seeing God at work in your life. 
which becomes a part of the testimony. The Bible tells us that we overcome the devil. What? Through what? Through the blood of the lamb, that's Jesus, and the word of our testimony, what that has done in our life. People, people might be watching right now and they might be thinking, yes, pastor, you have life together. But when they see their friend who was a mess walk in supernatural victory, they see their friend who was in bondage and addiction, depression and brokenness come out of it. They start to say, now I believe there's something working here. So you possessing, we learned last week, is not just about you, it's also about generations to come. How many of you know, our founding pastor literally saw a church, a calling that God asked him to walk in. And today I'm here because my father said yes to the call of God on his life. So it's generational. It's generational. We don't settle with God did something great. We always believe what God is yet to do. It's generational. Amen. And we very, we understand that we see far because we stand on the shoulders of giants, but we are still called to see further, go further, do more. And so today, as we speak on the subject of possessing what God has promised you, the second part of the series, I wanted to talk to you about the subject, the battle is the Lord's. Now, we were looking at the story of Joshua, and we learned last week that certain things happened that we were unaware of. Uh, in Scripture, it actually tells us that before Joshua is commissioned into the role of leading the nation of Israel into the promised land, his name changed. He went from the name Hoshea to Joshua, and Hoshea speaks of man's strength, man's salvation, man's a mighty warrior, but Joshua speaks of God's strength, God is salvation, God is our warrior. And we see this theme all throughout the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, we see pictures that be, become revealed and obvious in the New Testament. There's always a picture of Christ in the story. Wherever there's victory, wherever there's overcoming, wherever there is miracles and turnarounds, you'll find Jesus' story is woven into it. And so with Joshua, we even recognize before he possesses the promised land, things start to happen, encounters start to happen. But the calling of God on the nation of Israel was never to live in the wilderness. Do you know that you can walk from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land in literally, depends on your speed, weeks or months? It wasn't supposed to take 40 years, right? It wasn't a geographical issue. What was the issue? There was a spirit at work in the people that hindered them from possessing. What was that spirit? Well, we saw last week when Moses sent out his spies and he says, tell me if the land is good. Tell me if the fruit is good. And then tell me what the enemy looks like. And the spies came back and they did say, yes, the land is amazing. Yes, the fruit is incredible. And we learned the fruit was even a picture of the work of Jesus. But then they said, nevertheless. And we learned that that word in Hebrew means the ankle or the knee joint to move. They said, no, we won't move. Nevertheless, we won't move towards the land because the giants are great. Because they are huge and they have houses that are huge and weapons that are huge. And the city Jericho itself is impenetrable. Yet Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. The spirit was not who do we face. The spirit was, is the land good? All they needed to hear was the land was good. And then they said, God is able to deliver it to us. So the spirit that gets you into the promised land is not a spirit that looks at you because nevertheless will analyze you, will analyze the situation, will analyze what you face. That's what nevertheless, oh, God's called you to this, but are you aware of your own shortcomings? Are you aware of the economic challenges? This is recently we, we, we um, a, a, as a church, 
this year, um, when I got the word for 2022 in my heart, it was look again. And we, we studied the passage of scripture called arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is upon you for behold, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the people. But it says, look up, now look around and see. And the language of look again in Hebrew there is, now that you've seen the finished work and the promises of God, look back at your situation and don't see the obstacles but the opportunity. Amen? Amen? It's a look again spirit. We see that declaration all over scripture. Do you see with the spiritual eye? And the other spies came back and they saw with the natural eye. And Moses was like, no, the nevertheless, you're gonna be stuck when you see things only by the natural. Today, you're gonna hear by the Holy Spirit how God is calling you, how God is leading you, how God is gracing you. But tomorrow when you listen to the news, you're gonna hear how the enemy is against you. When you listen to gossip, you're gonna hear all the plans that the enemy is busy preparing for you. When your body feels sick and weak, you're gonna hear from doctors and things about how it's impossible, how you can't expect God to give you long life, how you can't expect. And what happens? You have to decide whose report you're going to believe. So what's interesting when we look at the story is Joshua and Caleb, the Bible says, carry a different spirit. Now, they were not distinguished based on their behavior. It was not that Joshua and Caleb were better religious people than the other spies. They were not distinguished. They all represented tribes. They were all leaders. They were all respected. They were not distinguished apart based on what they did. They were, they were distinguished based on what they believed about God. Amen. One group believes that even though God has said it, the enemy is greater than I. The other party believes if God has said it, it is irrespective of what enemy we face. All I need to hear is, is that the best land? Is that where God is sending me? And it's interesting because around this whole situation, we see pictures of Jesus. And so often people will present Christianity as a belief system in your own behavior. Have you done enough? Have you served enough? Have you earned enough? But no, actually, to truly be godly, meaning to have the favor and the grace of God in your life, is only conditional on are you righteous? If you're righteous, everything else is settled with God. And the interesting thing is righteousness is the work of Jesus. Our righteousness is a gift from Jesus. The Bible tells us that in Romans 5 verses 17, through one man's sin, one man's offense, meaning Adam, death reigned through that work. I don't know about you, but I think Adam has a very special security system in heaven. Because when we get there, we're gonna say, but from the day I was born, I was a sinner because of you. It is incredible. You're literally born a sinner. You do not need to teach a child to lie, to be jealous and to compete and to steal. It's just in them. It's the nature, right? As cute as they are, they're still naughty. They're not innocent. The moment that mind develops, it's selfish, right? That's because of Adam's offense. And what came in with Adam's offense? Death. Death, sickness, and everything else that is a consequence of sin, the noun being present. But the Bible says, if death reigned through Adam, the first Adam, much more, say much more. Much more, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in this life through the ultimate one, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And we even learned last week that when they crossed the Jordan, right? The Bible tells us the waters of Jordan re receded all the way back. And Jordan means to descend from an area called Zeratan, meaning the heaviness, the depression of people. 
The waters of Jordan descended all the way back to Zeratan, the area of heaviness, into what city? The city of Adam. So the judgment and everything that came down from that region all the way back to the first Adam when the ark, being Jesus, crossed the Jordan, everything that came from the first Adam had to go back. So when we look at this, it's not that, that, that Jesus is, is just around to be nice. It is that he came to do a better work, to not even just restore, but to redeem, to make us better off than we were. Why? Because even in the Garden of Eden, there are things even greater now in heaven through Christ that we would have. And so we recognize righteousness cannot be earned by your effort. The gift of righteousness, the abundance of grace, grace meaning what Jesus has done for me, grace meaning what God desires for me. And even what's more awesome is, even if you look at Jesus, sometimes we hear what Jesus has done for me, what Jesus has done for me. Do you know Jesus is still doing things today? The Bible tells us that in heaven, he is our high priest. And often people are like, that's great. But you need to know what that means because the role of the high priest of the nation of Israel at the time was the ultimate role because a prophet represents God to man and that's why we can call some people false prophets because they represent God very poorly. You know, the scripture says prophecy is for edification, to build you up, not condemnation. Woe is me. God sees great judgment. You're like, that's not prophecy. Out, junk, rubbish, right? Jesus was also prophet, priest, king, but prophet represents God to man, right? But priest represents man to God. Big difference. Good high priest, good life. Bad high priest, bad life. Because if he fails in representing you to God, then what? You stand in his work, right? If he fails a test, you fail the test. If he gets 100%, you get 100%. So the high priest was everything. Now Jesus is our high priest. This is so, it's such good news. Let me tell you why. You know, the Bible says that right now, in heaven, Jesus does what? He makes intercession for the believers. Can I give you a picture of what that means literally? Because we think Jesus is in heaven praying long prayers, right? Even some people, they, they intercede, and intercession is precious, but be very careful what we call intercession, because begging and pleading with God is not intercession. You, you, you imagine my child stood before me, and he said, Dad, I'm going with the, the shaking voice, the gospel voice, right? Dad, heavenly dad, earthly dad, father with whom I declare, I ask for favor, father. Today, we plead our case before you. You'd look at my child doing that in front of me and go, like, well, what's wrong with this dad? What type of relationship's happening here? Like, why is his child scared? Why is his child pleading his case as if he's uncertain as to whether he would find favor with his father? No, my child comes up to me very easily, all too often. Dad, help. Dad, do. Dad, jump. Dad, go. Right? And that's natural. You know, Scripture says if you are evil, yet you love your children unconditionally, how much more? Does the heavenly father love his children? If you being selfish love your children unselfishly, how much more he who is never selfish? So we start to recognize that coming to God in a way that we present ourselves, intercession is not Jesus going, please, Lord, these believers through me in you, these children of God, this church, please, Lord, no, intercession there is a Greek word called entenchamo. It has a purpose and it speaks to the function of high priest. Wow, that's interesting. 
Do you know that in the Old Testament, when they needed favor with God or they needed forgiveness, right? They, they needed God to do something. Whether it was a good thing or to help them with something bad, they would approach the high priest. Why? Because the high priest represents you to God. And they would come with a sacrifice or an offering. Now, if you were wealthy, you would come with a big oxen or a bunch of oxen or cows or whatever. But if you had nothing, God was so gracious that anything you could catch, you could come to the high priest with. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever tried to catch a chicken or something? I'm not that quick and I'm not that good. I'd only catch not only the bird, I'd catch the bird that's injured. <laughs> I'd probably be the guy that if a bird fell out the nest, a baby and landed, I'd run and grab it and run to the high priest with it. That's a pathetic sacrifice, isn't it? Right? But here's the interesting thing. I would come with the pathetic sacrifice and the high priest was responsible to hear my cry, hear what I called for, hear what I needed and take that sacrifice that at that time is not pleasing to God, and he was responsible to perfect it so that by the time he presented it on the altar before God, it was pleasing to God. And if the high priest presented it the right way and he cleansed it, God would answer the person's prayer, the person's cry, the person's need, all right? So, that word, that word is entenhamo, preparing, perfecting, working. Do you know that in the New Testament, the word for sin is the Greek word hamartia. Hamartia, which means missing the mark. I don't know if you've ever heard people say, I missed the mark because I sinned. I missed the mark because I sinned. The direct opposite is what? Hitting the mark. If I was to say to you, you missed the mark, but I'm glad you did it a different way because this time you hit the mark, I would say to you, you had hamartia, but now you have entenchamo. So Jesus takes your prayers, takes your, your situation. Your, Lord, help me. It's not fair that I'm going through this. That's a little bit of selfishness, all right? You know, I've trusted you before and it didn't work out again. Not really giving God his place, understood. And I really need you to deal with that person and burn them with fire. That's not very gracious. But Lord, really, I'm just broken and help me. Jesus takes those prayers right now as your high priest, your selfishness, your issues, your stuff, and he perfects it. So that by the time it gets to the heavenly father, it's pleasing. He does the same in Hebrews with your tithe. Come on now. You know, when I tithe every month, just before I tithe, I'm like, oh, I can't afford this. Oh, I don't know how we're gonna do this. This petrol price, these education fees help us Jesus. Right? That's not giving in faith, everyone. I'm being honest with you. But the moment I give, Lord, it's in your hands, I get rest because I realize now Jesus is perfecting it before the Father. Now it's about his work. So we start to look at this and we see that when we are in need, who do we go to? Jesus. That's faith. In fact, repentance in Scripture is not saying sorry to God. It is not coming saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because often when we say sorry, we still repeat the behavior. I mean, sometimes we're sorry for getting caught. We're not sorry for what we did. You know, with our kids, Dad, I'm sorry. You're not sorry because you did it yesterday and you did it the day before and you did it today. I'm sorry, Dad, I'll never do it again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The Greek word for repentance is not be sorry, it is renew your mind to the way God thinks, metanoia, change your thinking. And for some people you think, well, I must think holy thoughts, I must think holy thoughts. No, I need to think about me in Christ as holy. Right? I need to think about me in Christ as healed. Even people who struggle with smoking, don't tell God, I'll give up smoking. While you're smoking, say, I'm not addicted to this in Christ Jesus. 
This is not going to have a hold of me in Christ Jesus. Some people say, well, I'm going to smoke quickly. Okay, I'll never do it again. I'm going to smoke quickly. I'll never do it again. No, that's not repentance. Repentance is while you're smoking. This is not who I am in Christ. God is, because when you break the mindset of seeing yourself based on who you are in Jesus, you'll start to behave that way. Pastor, now you're standing all over my theology. And if you don't repent, you won't get saved. True. But repentance is not, I'm sorry. How do you know that, Pastor? He's the first person that got told they were going to heaven in Christ's time. Two thieves hanging on a cross. One said, I don't believe you. The other one said, I believe you're the Messiah. Today, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't stop and say, please pray the prayer of repentance. It was about his thinking. I see, you're, you're my Messiah. You're my Messiah. Today you'll be with me in heaven. You're Messiah. Today you'll be with me in heaven. Woman at the well, you're Messiah. <laughs> Go tell everyone. Go spread the gospel. You're commissioned into a calling. Because, because th 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 that right there is blowing your world right open in a good way. For some of you, I don't know if my dad prayed the prayer. I don't know if they confessed. Well, you know what? We believe. We believe that the work of Jesus is greater. Do you know that under the Old Testament, if there was one believer in the house, the house was saved? How much more the blood of Jesus? Do you know that in, it tells us, anyways, it tells us when, when we see the revelation of heaven, that in heaven there is an amount of people that no man can number. Impossible to count. It never gives the same numerical value to hell. Yet we live like narrow is the way. Yes, narrow is the way when I'm talking to a group of people who are Pharisees that don't believe Jesus is Messiah and they can earn their way by keeping the law. But broad is the way for those who don't know how to save themselves and they're seeking him out. I still believe personally Jesus appears to people. Because it, it, what if you are abused or misused by a pastor? What if you were sexually abused? Now you go to hell because you don't believe that that person was saying something? I believe God's grace is far greater. But there's merit in believing now because if we believe now, we start to walk in the righteous identity without waiting for heaven. Now we get to walk in grace without waiting for heaven. You know, the motivation is not just escaping hell, it's experiencing heaven. Anyway, we'll, get, we'll teach some series in church about losing your salvation. You don't lose it. It's not a set of keys. And it can't be taken from you. Pastor, what happens when someone says they don't believe in God? You know how many times my kids have told me I'm not their parent? <laughs> Every week. You're not my dad. You don't love me. I'm not giving you chocolate for breakfast. I'm not your son. No, I take them, I drop them out there in the streets and I leave them to fend for themselves. That's what I do when they say they're not my son. Grace is greater. Grace is greater. And for some of you, you're sitting, you're watching here and you say, uh, is it true I can believe that my, my loved one went to heaven? Receive that promise over your home. Receive that promise over your home. Pastor, what if, oh, I'm getting into dodgy territory today. Pastor, what if they took their own life? Driving fast is taking your own life. Eating junk is taking your own life. Smoking cigarettes is taking your own life. If only Judas had wait for someone else to hang on a tree, he wouldn't have been lost. How do you know that? Because Peter denied Christ. Denial was a greater sin than betrayal under the law. Yet Peter's the first name called in the new covenant. Come back. Come back to the discipleship, buddy. You boasted in your own strength, and that's where it got you. But when it's about my goodness and my grace, I come looking for you. When Jesus described the father, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, the language was, God comes looking for you. God comes looking to find you. But pastor, the, the, the prodigal son decided to come home. He only wanted to come home because he was starving, not to be, not to change. And then he prepared a long speech of manipulation. I'm going to say, dad, I messed up. I'm not worthy of 
being your son, but at least the servants in your house have bread. Can I just come and he doesn't even get to the speech. The dad sees him, comes running, jumps on him, kisses him and hugs him and immediately does a work. In fact, part of my, my sermon today was to tell you about righteousness. Like we said, the part of the righteousness is where the fight is. It's for are you righteous? If you're righteous, everything else follows. And it's interesting because it actually tells us in, in this book of Joshua when he goes to God and, God and he says to God, just before the battle of Jericho, he has an encounter with the angel of the Lord. And he says to the angel of the Lord in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13, he says, are you for us or our enemies? And the angel replied, no, but as a commander of the Lord, I've now come. Joshua fell on his face and, wor face and worshiped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take the sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. So Joshua does this. Now this is under the law, under the 10 commandments. This, when God reveals himself under the law, he says, you're not worthy in your own ability. So take your shoes off because the picture of your feet is a picture of where you've been. I mean, practically, right? If you, it was raining outside now and someone came in and their shoes are wet, you would say you were just outside in the rain. If someone was walking through mud, you would know that they'd been in mud. So what God says to Moses, to Joshua, and over and over says, take off your shoes for where you stand is holy, meaning you can't stand here because it's under the Ten Commandments. You are not holy right? But what's interesting is in the New Testament, we see the reverse, right? For when Jesus describes the father in heaven with the prodigal son, the first thing the dad does to the son who just came from a pigsty, literally walking in pig feces, living in pig, seeds, pig feces, what does he say? He's not trying to tell his dad, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't, no, no, shush, quick, put sandals on his feet, because it's about the father's redemption of the lost son. In fact, we see that story with Ruth and Boaz, where Ruth is to be redeemed by Boaz. Her first husband dies, and she's not worthy, and no one wants to marry her. No one wants to redeem her. And Boaz, as a picture of Jesus, who owns all the fields, decides he chooses to redeem her. Now, in order for him to have permission to redeem her, he has to go and get the sandals from every past relative who had a right to Ruth, but refused to redeem her based on her past. And he comes with all the sandals as proof. I've gone to everyone that wanted nothing to do with your past, and I have redeemed you from it. So it's literally the opposite. Now in Christ, put sandals on your feet. Stand in my presence, for you are holy in Christ and worthy to be in the presence of God. Whenever somebody fell on their face at the feet of Jesus, he would bend down, give them what they needed, and then told them, rise, go. You are changed. You are different. It is the ministry of Jesus that bends down and grabs you where you are and lifts you up. There's nothing wrong with worshiping on your face and on your knees, but make no mistake, when we worship, our eyes must not be on our unrighteousness, our inability, our badness, but on His goodness, His love, and His grace. It, it, it is, it's, it's amazing. It's too good to be true. That's why it's called the too good to be true gospel. And so Joshua is told by the angel of the Lord, it's not about your side or their side, I'm on my own side. Now this is powerful because you need to recognize when the devil comes, when your feelings come, when your circumstances come and they say, are you doing enough for God, for God to be on your side? You need to recognize God is not on your side in your own effort, he is on your side through Christ. In other words, God through Christ is righteous in declaring you righteous. He, he has gone through the courts of this world. He has stood and the advocate, the Holy Spirit stands and testifies that crime that was against humanity. Christ came, served the punishment, now declaring humanity who was guilty, innocent. 
God is righteous in declaring you righteous because he did not go soft on sin. He sent his son to die for all of it. And forever in Christ, the devil owes God. Forever. It was an overpayment for your sin. Never ever think that when the devil comes and says, you can't access God now, you haven't done enough. How dare you approach God? You, you haven't prayed in months. What gives you the right to pray now? You know what's interesting is we know Jesus was without sin sent as the son of God. You know Jesus didn't pray long prayers to have favor with God. When he showed up at the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus was dead four days. In Jewish typology, they believe the spirit of a person leaves within the first three days after death. That's why every tomb would have a small little window high up, not just for the stench to get out as the body decomposes, but for the spirit to escape within the first three days. That's why on the third day, right? But when Lazarus was dead four days, he was dead, 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 dead. <laughs> and Jesus shows up, and what does he do? Does he go with a quivering voice? Oh, God, mighty Father in heaven. Now, nothing wrong if that's how you pray, but you don't need to impress God or people. He shows up righteous, so he has access. He stands and he says, God, you hear my prayers. Lazarus, come forth. It, that is how we are to pray. I have access. Not based on our work, not based on our effort, based on the work of our priest. His work for you. Always perfecting, always making precious, always making beautiful. And so as the nation of Israel approached Jericho, this fortified city, this place designed as a monument to the authority of their enemies. This place designed from afar that as you approach, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 17, we know the scripture. It says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And what servants is Isaiah prophetically speaking of? And their righteousness is from me. It's a picture of us whose righteousness is not based on our work, but based on the righteousness God has purchased for us. Okay? So no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, can I give you some literal picture to this? Do you know that the nation of Israel was at a disadvantage for the majority of the time that they are literally in the Old Testament? A huge portion of time they're at a disadvantage. Can I show it to you in 1 Samuel chapter 19? Verses, uh, let's start at, at verses, sorry. One, it's actually 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 19 through 22. It says, no blacksmith. There is no blacksmith, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19. No blacksmith in the land, right? Nothing. And what happens? They have nowhere to get weapons. Okay, so 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19 and through. It's so specific, it actually says that the nation of Israel has to go and purchase their weapons or have them mended from the Philistines. When we speak of a weapon being formed, it literally is a depiction of weapons being designed and forged and made. Now, the nation of Israel did not possess the technology to make iron weapons. The Philistines kept it a closely guarded secret. So that is why, in a literal event, David shows up with a sling and five stones. 
That is why Gideon stands with an army and says, blow the trumpet and smash the vases. Because they don't possess weapons like for like against the Philistines. And even Saul's armor would probably have had to have been purchased or made by the Philistines at some point. So when it says no weapon formed, it literally means the enemy has forged and formed weapons that you could never make, that you could never compete with. As the nation of Israel approaches this place, Jericho, following Joshua and the ark, they are reminded it grows bigger and bigger and bigger whilst they walk. And they don't have the arrows and the spears and the swords. It's not a strategy. It's not a plan to just, what are we going to do, Joshua? Wait, you'll see. That's why it is called the battle is the Lord's. Because there is no other way for you to have victory except for God to do something supernatural. Right? So Joshua chapter 6 tells us, verses 1 through 13, I'll summarize for the sake of time. God says, as you approach this place, Jericho, Joshua, I want you to know something in verse 2. I have given Jericho into your hand. I have given Jericho into your hand. See, I have given Jericho into your hand. Now, at the time, what would Joshua have seen? Jericho is not in his hands. The city is occupied by my giant enemies with weapons I can't even compete with. And God says, look again. Look again based on the promise I gave you. Look again based on the promises I've declared over you. I've given you this city, right? Look at it a different way. Look at it with the supernatural eye. See, the other spies would have said, we're getting closer to the enemy. We're getting closer to this fortified city, closer to death. But Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. And what did they see? See, this is the city. Why do we see this is the city? Is this the best city? Yes, it is. Is this the most fortified and protected city? Yes, it is. Does it have fruit that you could eat for days on with, with just getting full on one fruit? Yes. Does it have houses so big we could never build it? Yes. See, this is the city God has planned for us, purpose for us, right? Seeing with the supernatural eye. Seeing yourself on the other side of God's work. Now, we can take this even more literally, seeing ourselves on the other side of the work of Jesus, Seeing ourselves, God, I have nothing, but as I tithe, I trust that the work of my high priest multiplies my finances supernaturally. God, I, I, I don't have strength in my bones, but as I, as I pray and receive healing, as I partake in communion, I trust that the broken body of Jesus was broken for me, and I see myself whole on the other side of the work of Jesus. Do you know that there's a practical example of this in Scripture? The Bible tells us the woman with the issue of blood heard Jesus, the rabbi who heals, was coming through town. She was not even allowed to approach a rabbi normally. Unclean people, meaning people with disease, were perceived cursed by God. They were not allowed in the temple. They were not allowed near the priesthood. You know that if someone who was unclean, someone who had leprosy came and touched the high priest, the high priest would be unclean. Even though he was clean, if he had an interaction with someone who was unclean, the unclean would make him unclean. But Jesus, our high priest, out of the order of Melchizedek, when he sees a person with leprosy who says, I know you heal, but would you heal me? He doesn't just say, you are healed, my son. He says, come here, and he hugs him. And he touches him because when the high priest, Jesus, who is clean, touches someone who is unclean, the unclean becomes clean. The dead come to life. The demon possessed are set free. But I love it because Jesus doesn't just say be healed. Jesus gives, you know, this man came and he said, I want you to heal me. But Jesus knew he needed not just healing, but love. If you have leprosy, no one will touch you. How long would that gentleman have gone without an embrace? Yet God himself says, not only am I prepared to heal you, I'm prepared to hold you. 
For some of you listening right now, you feel God doesn't want to love you. God doesn't want to hold you. You're just like, well, I'm just in church to be forgiven. God doesn't just want to say you're forgiven. He wants to tell you you're precious, you're pleasing, and he loves you. And, and right now, as I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit is holding you and telling you you're precious. Maybe you were raised in a home where you've been abused and overlooked and misused by people. Maybe you're in a relationship where you've been abused and misused your whole life. That is not how God sees you. He loves you. And that woman saw herself, Scripture says, healed and whole after she touched Jesus. So she didn't approach him without a plan. The Bible says she saw herself healed if she could just get to him. And what does she grab his robe of? Righteousness. And she's healed. You have to see yourself on the other side of the work of Jesus. Let me tell you what it's like to receive the work of Jesus. The Bible tells us that Joshua is instructed by God to walk one time around the city of Jericho for six days. But on the seventh day, go seven times around. Now, six in Scripture is always the number of man. But seven in Scripture is the number of God's fullness. But it's even further than that. It is actually the number of rest. On the seventh day, God rested. It is actually speaking of resting in the work of God. So God says, go seven times around on the seventh day. And he also gives them a little hint. He says in verse 10, do not make a noise with your voice. No word shall proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. We need to be careful what we do with our mouths when God is preparing victory for us. So literally Moses tells everyone, don't say anything. Because come on, if you were me walking around one time a day, you know, you're just reminded of how big this city is, how high these walls are. Make no, make no mistake, the Philistines and all of those who occupied Jericho were standing on the walls, the soldiers showing them their arrows, mocking them, laughing at them, spitting on them. I mean, they didn't even need arrows. They could just throw bricks but let's be honest here, you're walking around being reminded how the enemy is higher, he's greater, he's stronger. Thank goodness God said, don't say a word, because I can tell you what would have said. How is this a plan? How is this a strategy? God is sending us like, like lambs to the slaughter. This is not even, is Joshua lost his mind here? Really now, we're walking here. You know what I'm trying to say? The Bible even tells us on the other side of the Jordan, it was green pastures. You know, there was a whole tribe that stayed behind. We should have stayed with them. What have we done? We crossed the Jordan to die. And God says, though, on the seventh time, on the seventh day, stop. And the Bible says, blow a horn, a, tum a trumpet. But there's a specific type of blow. God instructs the people to do a specific type of blast of the trumpet. Now, they didn't have trumpets. Remember, they couldn't forge metal. The trumpet is the shofar. It's the horn of a ram. And what is the ram a picture of? Jesus. When Abraham was going to try to sacrifice Isaac, God said, no, see, I will supply for myself a sacrifice. And he told Abraham, look again. And he saw a ram in the thicket to be sacrificed. It's always a picture of the death of Jesus. But they were told to blow a specific blast. I don't have a long time to go into it. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25, it says, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. This picture of rest, it's all around Rosh Hashanah. But the thing is, this blast of the trumpet has a specific instruction. And this blast of the trumpet is the same blast used throughout the Old Testament for victories. When Gideon blasts the trumpet, when David would go to war, it is called the horn of victory, right? It's like the song of victory. The battle cry was this blast. And this blast is called the Teruah blast. And it has a specific instruction by God. And it is you take the shofar and you blow, but as you blow, your tongue must tap the shofar nine times to make nine short, sharp blasts, okay? That is the horn of victory, the horn that comes before a battle that God has given you for victory. 
nine short sharp blasts. It sounds like ba 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 like that. Ba 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 ba. You tap it with your tongue. Now, what's interesting is the Bible tells us that our tongues in Romans six thirteen must not be presented evil. In Romans six thirteen, it says, "Let your member, your tongue, be used of righteousness." So Joshua says, "Don't say anything, but when the time comes." Give a shout of praise and blast the trumpet. Right? In Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us in verse 17, we have armor that God has given us in the new covenant. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. It's an offensive weapon. You don't have an iron sword. You don't have a natural sword, a natural strategy, a natural plan, you have a spiritual solution. Wait for this. Nine short, sharp blasts. We have nine fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 verses 22. And in Corinthians 12 verses 7 through 11, we have nine gifts of the Spirit. But the Bible tells us when we pray in tongues, Right, right, it is literally declaring victory. It is the sword of the Spirit that goes ahead of us, that attacks. And what does it even sound like? Right? Do you know that when the high priest would cut covenant on behalf of the nation of Israel's sin, to accept the redemption and the righteousness and attain the covering of sin from God. It is recorded in rabbinical scrolls over and over that they would speak in a language unbeknown to man, the language of victory. It tells us in the book of Habakkuk that the priest would pray and it sounded like he had cleft tongue. This prayer of victory. So what does the Bible say? When you're facing your enemy with every weapon, don't speak carnally. Don't speak naturally. Let the Spirit of God well up inside of you and pray. And tongues is not about volume and length. It is about switching off the natural mind, switching off the declaration of the enemy, switching off what's coming against you and saying, I'm gonna pray. When I don't know what to pray, I allow the Lord to pray in and through me. And when we do that, the walls come down. And you know what's an amazing testimony about Jericho? <laughs> Can you imagine walking into that place on the other side of that victory and going, this is the grace of God on my life, a testimony of the glory of God because I never made these weapons now I possess them. I never built these houses. Now I live in it. I never sowed this crop. Now I eat it. I never even made the city, the very city designed to be a monument to my oppression, now becomes a city I occupy as an anointing, as a testimony to declare to everyone, I, I, I had a terrible this, I went through deep depression, I tried to kill myself, I had major addiction, I had major this, but today, by resting in the finished work of Jesus, He did a work in me, that now that test is a testimony where I can tell people, I was once like that, I was once facing that but as I received Jesus he did a work in me not by might not by power but by the Holy Spirit of the Lord are we able to possess everything that he's promised us come on stand up do you believe it today father I declare right now in this place people watching people listening people in this place they receive by the Holy Spirit. They are called to possess a promised land. And even though the enemy has crafted and made weapons that are far greater than anything we have, far greater than anything we could ever possess, we declare today, we don't know how, but we know the Lord is working. And we know that this battle is His. And we will come out on the other side, possessing the weapons that the enemy formed against us, that all things will work together for good, that we see ourselves healed and whole, provided for, protected, 
Even if we're here today and we've completely failed you up until this point, God, you've never failed us. And today we receive that finished work identity as called children of God, called to possess, not just for us, but for generations. We are gonna go in response to God and be a part of his kingdom calling on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. How good is Jesus this morning? What an amazing word. Jesus loves us. And maybe some of you are sitting here today going, I want this Jesus. I don't know this Jesus that I'm hearing being spoken of here today, but I want him. I want him to come and be my Lord and my Savior. And we heard today, you don't have to come and get yourself right. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to sort everything out. What do you have to do? Come in your need. The only thing that qualifies you to be saved is the need of a savior. That's what qualifies you to receive him, to accept him into your heart, is recognizing I don't have a savior and I need one. And it's Jesus. So we're gonna pray a prayer today and we're all gonna pray it. And if you've never accepted him or asked him to come into your heart, pray this prayer today. It says in the word of God, when we ask him with our mouth and, and believe with our hearts, we are saved once and for all. You cannot lose your salvation. So we're gonna to pray today and if you've never prayed it, and you just feel that unctioning, pray it with us today. Amen? Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart today. Be my Lord, be my Savior. I acknowledge that you died on the cross for me, for my sin, for my shame, my weaknesses. Thank you, Jesus, that I am a child of God according to your finished work. Loved, accepted, chosen, forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, that you are my Lord, you are my Savior. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Let's give a round of applause. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we wanna pray with you, we wanna give you something. So if you're in the room today, go to our New Believers station um, in the foyer. We just wanna give you something, pray with you, greet you. Um, if you prayed that prayer online for the very first time, please just, Type a message, I prayed that prayer for the first time. We will reach out to you um, and just walk this road with you. We are excited. All of heaven is rejoicing over you today. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. So now we're going to take communion. So um, if you didn't receive one on the way in, you can just slip your hand up. We'll make sure we just get one to you. Hopefully you all have one at home. Um, if you haven't got it prepared, you can hit pause, go and grab some communion, um, and let's partake together today. Amen. So if you do have these communions, you just need to flip the little tab at the front up and down, and then it just gives you access to all the different layers, and you can just take your bread in your hand. And let's just lift up the body of Jesus today. Amen. We thank you, Lord. You can stand, you can sit, whatever you feel comfortable with, do that. Just make sure your eyes are on Jesus and his finished work in this moment. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your body on the cross that bore every sickness, every disease, every symptom, every lying symptom. We thank you, Jesus. We see it on your body on the cross today. We see COVID-19 on your body on the cross today. We see every lack, every weakness, 
in our bodies, tiredness, we see it on you. We thank you, Jesus, that we are healed, we are whole, we are strengthened according to your broken body, to your whipping, to your stripe. We thank you, Jesus. We receive and eat of it today in Jesus' name. We lift up the blood today. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood that was poured out for us, that washes us white as snow, washes over every shame, every failure, wrong thinking. We thank you, Father, that we are made righteous children of God, pleasing, loved, accepted, chosen, called, anointed, appointed according to your blood that washes us, it cleanses us, it covers us, it protects us. Our home, our children, our households, our marriages, we thank you for your blood that washes over us. In Jesus' name, receive it today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Father, that we live our lives according to your finished work. That no matter what we do, no matter how busy we are, no matter where we are, that we will see through the lens of the finished work. That when we see the finished work, we get given new eyes. We recover our sight according to the finished work. We look again at our circumstances, at our situations, because we see you, Jesus. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for watching today's Word. I know you were blessed greatly and I want to let you know if you want more resource like this, more sermons like this, they're all available for free on YouTube or on our Redemption Church app. So I want to encourage you, if it blessed you, share this link with someone else and ensure that you get more of God's goodness and Word in you. We are so excited that Redemption Church has been able to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ today and look forward to seeing you return for more of God's goodness as we preach the word of Jesus. Be blessed.